Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, should it be easier to choose your sex in the eyes of the law? The government says yes, and it's planning to tear up the rules to make gender reassignment process far more straightforward. Well, earlier this week, Sophie did sit down with the Equalities Minister and, of course, the Education Secretary, Justine Greening. Today we're announcing that in the autumn we'll be launching a consultation on reforming the Gender Recognition Act. And at the moment, if you want to change your gender, it's a very complicated process. Uh, it's quite intrusive as well and it's, it's very uh, bound up in going to see your GP and a whole medical process that then gets kicked off. What we want to do is try and streamline the process, make it easier, uh, demedicalise it and make it less intrusive and, and we'll be consulting on how to do that in the autumn. And I think 50 years after we began the decriminalisation of homosexuality, although we've had huge progress on LGBT rights, there are still areas like this where we think we can do more and we want to take those steps. And some people may have a concern listening to this about the idea of making it easier, making it quicker to change your gender. I mean, for most people, this would be the biggest decision you make in your life. So isn't it right that these things are, take a bit of time? I think it's about helping it to take place more effectively. And we know in other countries, for example, the Republic of Ireland or Malta, they have a very different approach on this. It's much more about a legal change of your identity that's then followed by, uh, you know, the medical process that people go through. So would you like to see then the UK having the same system as the Republic of Ireland or Malta where people can effectively self-identify their gender? I think it's one of the things that we need to be looking at. But the, the bottom line is at the moment we have a very complex, lengthy process. It is time to streamline that, make it more straightforward, to demedicalise it and to stop treating uh, people changing their gender as if it's some medical problem that they need fixing. Actually, this is a choice that people are making, and we need to try and make that choice uh, more, more straightforward in a way than it currently is. Is there a wider issue uh, as well about the way that we look at gender stereotypes in our society? If we were a bit more open-minded about what it means to be a man or a woman, uh, perhaps that should be the focus uh, rather than uh, looking at you know, the, the gender that someone identifies as? I think probably society's never uh, focused less on people's gender. I think we've seen huge steps forward, and, and I've fought for women's rights for many years. Uh, this week we've seen, of course, the gender pay gap reporting from uh, the BBC, which has caused a huge debate, quite rightly, about um, closing that gap. That's precisely why we brought through those requirements for, for big organisations to start reporting. But I, I do think what you're seeing is uh, gender equality steadily percolating through uh, the workplace, through our society. Uh, it's great that after this election we've never had more female MPs. But when you look at that and, and diversity more generally, it's something we still need to keep pushing for. And on LGBT rights, we've made a lot of steps forward over the last 50 years. Of course, same-sex marriage going through Parliament was a massive watershed moment for our country but there's still a long way to go. Let's talk uh, for a bit more, a bit more about the uh, gender pay gap that was uh, revealed uh, in that uh, BBC report. Were you shocked to see the discrepancy between what uh, male and female uh, workers at the BBC were paid? I think it's impossible not to be shocked, to be honest, at just how different some of those differentials were. And of course, this is the whole reason why we brought forward these regulations, because as much as anything else, transparency is demonstrating to organisations that it's a reputational issue. And that's why they should be fixing these things. It happens to be good business as well. We know that uh, companies that make the most of all of their workforce and that don't have barriers to women coming back into the uh, workforce at senior levels, for example, if they've had children uh, being able to continue their careers, all these things are signs of companies that tend to do better. Uh, but actually it's the right thing to do as well and, and for us as a government we've wanted to work with business and many businesses have changed for the better but the gender pay gap reporting is one way that we can really shine a light on the companies that are doing a good job but also the organisations that have got a very very long way to go and, and I does, think does the BBC, the BBC found out this week that its gender pay gap reporting 
was really quite staggering to, to many people. And, Is it and an example all, of sexism in the workplace, you think? I th well, I think it's already kicked off a debate for the BBC about these differentials and the steps that they will now need to look at taking to close them. But it is very hard to justify some of the, the big gaps that we saw. Um, we were talking a bit uh, earlier, of course, about um, gay rights as well, uh, which f feels fit and proper to do at the time when it's the 50th uh, anniversary of the partial decriminalisation of homosexuality. Um, as someone who uh, is a gay woman yourself, do you think it's time that churches allowed same-sex couples to marry inside them if they want to? Well, this is, this is a massive debate when we brought forward um, the same-sex bill. I think it's quite important that we recognise that for, for many churches, including the Church of England, actually that was not something they were yet willing to have in, in their own churches. Other churches, like the Quakers, for example, were. So I respect that those faiths will have a debate about the right way for them to, to, to be part of a, a country that has passed legislation allowing same-sex marriage. I think when you look at the social attitude survey data that came out a couple of weeks ago, two-thirds of people saying they think there's nothing wrong with the same-sex relationship. What, I think it is think, important what, what, that... What's your sense, rather than the social well, attitude survey? Well, I was about survey, to say, Sophie, think? I think it is important that the, the church, in a way, keeps up and is part of a modern, a modern country. I, I wouldn't... Uh, prescribe to them how they uh, should deal with that but I do think we're living in a country where people broadly recognize that um, attitudes are in a different place now to where they were many many years ago we have allowed same-sex marriage that's a massive step forward for the better and for me I think people do want to see our, our major faiths keep up with with modern attitudes in our country uh, one political party who may not be keeping up with uh political attitudes as you would see them are the DUP, the new, your new political bedfellows. How relaxed are you about their attitudes uh, towards people uh, who are homosexual or uh, lesbian? Well, I think it's important to say that we absolutely did not agree with them on those sorts of views. Uh, we've done a deal with them in order to be able to, to work effectively as a government, and I think that's important. I think that's what people wanted us to do after the election, is to get on with the business of government. But it doesn't mean that we agree with the DUP on every aspect of policy. Are you and comfortable with that deal? I am, because I think people do want us to get on with government, and I think in the context of delivering on Brexit, it's really important that we do that. But it doesn't mean we have to agree with every single uh, agenda item that the DUP has and we certainly don't in relation to LGBT rights. We've been really clear that there will be absolutely no backsliding on LGBT rights uh, in this government. How does it make you feel to be allied to a party where one of their MPs says he finds gay people repulsive? Well I think uh, it's important that we continue to have a to have a debate with, with people who have those views. They're not, of course, views that I agree with uh, one iota. I think that's a debate that's going on uh, in Northern Ireland, as it is actually in Ireland, where you know, that's a country where they may well have their own referendum on same-sex marriage next year. But I think it's important that we keep that debate going. And in a funny way, the deal that we've got with the DUP on having a functioning government is actually shining a spotlight on these issues all over again, I think, in a fresh way. And, and from my perspective, it's a chance for us to debate them, but to try and debate them and get some further progress in the whole of the UK, and I think that should include Northern Ireland. Now, you've announced more money for schools uh, this week, but it's coming from other areas of the education uh, budget, things like school sports, for example, sports facilities. Is this just a sticking plaster on a gaping wound when it comes to the funding for schools? I don't think so. We've got record funding going into our schools and I've announced another £1.3 billion that will be going into schools in 2018-19. I think that's really important and actually we're doing it through working harder in the department to run ourselves effectively. Actually I also announced a doubling of the PE and sports premium that will be going into schools to help them do more sports for, for our young people and children, not less. So. It's important that we get the investment right, and that's what my announcement was all about. That's also about making sure that it's fairly spread across schools in our country. But we shouldn't lose sight of 
the equally important, important fact, which is that school standards are going up and our schools are getting better. One of the really kind of hot potato issues, if you like, at the moment when it comes to education is the public sector pay. Uh, teachers, like other public sector workers, have endured years of having their pay frozen or capped. Do you think it's time that they got a sub substantial pay rise? Well, the, the Teachers Pay Review Board actually said that we could stay within our 1% cap, but within that it did actually suggest some flexibility for heads in terms of giving up to a 2% rise. I accepted those recommendations because they seem sensible to me. A couple of weeks ago I went into uh, one London school where people were talking about not being paid enough, feeling that they could never afford to buy a house because their pay wasn't going up enough. I mean, do you have a lot of sympathy for those teachers? I think as a government one of the things we've really focused on is on making sure that for people who are on lower pay uh, roles and in lower, lower paid jobs that we've really helped not just uh, help on, on things like fuel duty being frozen etc but also we've tried to make sure that they get to keep more of what they're earning so increasing the personal allowance has taken millions of people out of tax altogether it's given a tax cut to tens of millions of people and actually if you look at in the context of somebody who's on a salary of say 23 24 thousand pounds it's been the equivalent of a four percent equivalent pay rise overall so you're absolutely right to to talk about the the pay cap we've had and, and making sure that public sector pay remains competitive and that's why I've, I've accepted the recommendations of my independent pay review board before you go I'm keen to talk to you about the Conservative Party because of course you lost that majority at the general election just when you thought things can get any worse it seems like the cabinet's tearing itself apart why have so many people got it in for Philip Hammond the Chancellor <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's been lots of chatter through the paper, but I think any sensible person in our party, and obviously I've talked to a lot of our backbenchers, knows that what the public expect us to do is get on with delivering on Brexit and a, and a smart deal for Britain as we leave well, the it's EU. It's a bit of a distraction though, isn't it, when you've got cabinet ministers openly leaking to papers, when we had a whole succession of stories about what the Chancellor thought on everything from female train drivers to pay in the public sector. Yes, and indeed cabinet discussions should be had in private and I think people want to see all of us getting on with our jobs and that's precisely what I'm doing. For, for me as somebody who came through our state school system and would have achieved nothing without my education, I think it's vital that we, we absolutely focus on raising up standards in schools and, and, and that's what people expect me to do and they expect other cabinet ministers to be getting on with their jobs too. Talking to the Education Secretary, Justin.